Hello, my name is Yasmin Dudia. My pronouns are she and her. I am in an office in London and I have short black hair. I work as a creative technologist and researcher and I am interested in how technological practice reflects the power asymmetries of society. I'm particularly interested in how big data and AI reinforce social harms and what we can do as individuals and collectives to intervene. For this programme, I will be talking about the entanglement of the state and corporate interests, the effects of these relationships on the public and begin to think about possible interventions. I'll mention a couple of examples, describe a case study, and offer some frameworks as ways to think about how to confront these entanglements. Case study IBM. State and institutional infrastructures are shaped by corporate interests. Even though a state may call itself a democracy, and even though there may be civic participation, looking into the histories of how some public policies have been shaped by institutional relationships with private companies, we begin to see how so much of what may be considered democratic processes is actually political theatre and that there are hidden but powerful actors that influence our daily lives through their technological practice. IBM is an American technology company that has existed for over 100 years. It operates across many countries and has been instrumental in some of the most violent state policies in recent history. This is an image of a black and white poster from the 1930s of an eye looking down on a punch card with German writing and the word Hollerith. The Hollerith was a tabulating machine, an early version of the computer, which was used by German Nazi regime to develop a national census of ethnic groups and which would then go on to be used during the Holocaust. Despite US sanctions on the Nazi regime at the time, IBM was able to circumvent these laws and to facilitate the genocide of millions of Jews and other minorities. During apartheid South Africa, IBM supplied the Praetorian government with a technological infrastructure that helped uphold white supremacy. The racial classification passbook system processed and stored racial data and was used as an instrument in state-sanctioned violence against the indigenous black population. This is a black and white image of a newsletter handed out by an IBM workers union encouraging workers to speak up against IBM's complicity with the apartheid regime and the title IBM Speak Up with illustrations of a police officer pointing a gun and a hand with a pointing finger. IBM currently offers predictive policing software to police departments around the world. This is a promotional video showing a police officer buying a coffee at a convenience store anticipating a robbery. The assumed robber turns up, sees the police officer waiting and turns away. Although they do not make the underlying algorithms known to the public, the input that feeds the software can include personal data that's kept in police databases such as previous convictions and victim details, as well as unstructured data like images, video and chat room activity. Data mining and analytics is used to try and predict crime, 
with the claim that this process is unbiased and constantly outperforms human experts, though that claim is yet to be independently verified. The story of IBM is one of a tech corporation so entangled with state powers that it becomes immune to democratic processes, even when its behaviour causes harm and its products result in violence. The mechanisms of civic participation become useless. The public could not vote them in or vote them out. In this case, history has shown that the only thing that can stop this tech corporation's behaviour is to dismantle the state infrastructures that it is entangled with. When it becomes apparent that state powers serve the interest of capitalist powers rather than the public, we need to use our imagination to form strategies beyond the state horizon to think of interventions that may not involve institutional infrastructures. Challenging epistemologies. For interventions that rely on state infrastructure, they would need to conform to a system of knowledge and values prescribed by institutional authorities. In that process, there may be conflict when different knowledge and value systems confront each other, and so compromises and adjustments are made. It is more likely that the greatest compromises are made by the actors with the least power. Consider what that process may do to the integrity of an idea and what effect this may have on the people concerned. When Canadian colonialists claimed Indigenous land, the onus was on Indigenous populations who had existed there for thousands of years to prove their right to that land through the Canadian legal system. This infrastructure required proof of claims in the form of written and signed treaties. Indigenous populations did not have written languages or conventional maps or a Western calendar system. And so their claims were deemed invalid. Oral histories, however, are passed down generations and give an account of the land being used by indigenous populations long before settler colonists arrived. Traditional treaties were defined by complex mechanisms of matrilineal houses, clans and stewardships. In 1984, the Wet'suwet'en and Gitzkan nations launched a landmark case where they presented oral testimonies in indigenous languages. This is a sketch of a courtroom showing a judge sitting next to a pile of books and maps looking at an indigenous person giving testimony with traditional symbols floating up from their head. I will read a translated excerpt from Wet'suwet'en leader Johnny David's testimony. Eagle down is our law. It is blown in the direction of the people and it is similar to white man's way, now where they sign their name, Eagle Down is our law. Once Eagle Down is blown, the revenge or murder is stopped, and once that is done, you are not allowed to break that law. The same is done with the passing of a mountain or territory. The indigenous people were given permission by the state to present their case using court infrastructure. Some of their testimony was dismissed, some was accepted. During this process, the knowledge system and values of the dominant power become the standard to which other systems have to conform. Despite allowances, compromises and some land protection, Consider how such processes serve to reinforce power asymmetries and what that means for people away from power in the long term. Eurocentric and capitalist frameworks assign rigid, reductive 
and frankly unimaginative definitions to complex or intangible concepts. Such frameworks dismiss epistemologies that challenge them, particularly those that originate in the global south. Some concepts may have an inherent value that simply cannot be described or understood within these prescribed frameworks. Challenging colonial extractivism of land using state infrastructures has for the most part been futile. Courts value scientific studies and economic impact more than personal testimony. We see the same mechanism of colonial extractivism of natural resources being used by tech corporations to extract personal data from the public. This data, just like natural resources, will be sold for a profit in a process that benefits the tech power and harms the individual. Soft power, solutionism, obfuscation and entanglement with the state are all neo-colonial behaviours displayed in this process. Again, challenging these processes using state infrastructures requires the individual to assign a definition and a material value to the personal data being extracted. Because we exist in a capitalist system, this requires conforming to the idea that the value of personal data is determined by the amount of money it can be sold on for. The dominant power determines what valid sources of knowledge are and constructs institutions that impose its values and maintain its power. The value systems permeate every aspect of state infrastructure. The education system, law enforcement and international diplomacy. Technology corporations entangled with state power will display the same behaviour. It is impossible to imagine the amount of knowledge that has been forever lost over hundreds of years of colonial intellectual oppression. Those in power, whether governments or tech companies, do not have the best ideas. They simply define what valid sources and types of knowledge are. They claim a superior rationality, leverage their power and exclude everyone else from participating meaningfully in decisions that affect us all. Feminist interventions. A person has to use the terminology and framing prescribed by those with power in order to receive the resources and protections controlled by that power. For example, in order to access social housing, asylum or certain types of medical care, an individual must perform their situation in a way that is legible and convincing to the controlling power. Consider what such a process does to the individual or group of people concerned. It's exhausting and often humiliating to have to perform all the ways injustice may affect you, sometimes to the same power that is complicit in the cause of that injustice. The wonderful thing about justice is that it does not require permission from any authority, whereas participating in policy craft and court systems acknowledges and sustains institutional powers and can even add to trauma, particularly when these infrastructures are instruments in the harms that are being fought against. There are forms of intervention which don't require engaging with oppressive powers. Interventions which engage with the imagination of the public so that people can conceptualise ways of existing beyond the limitations of institutional powers. Interventions that are not necessarily situated in the tangible, that perhaps exist in a speculative reality or in collective memory, that if accessed can inform current activist goals. 
Interventions don't necessarily have to be active. Sylvia Winter describes a process of mutation where internal reflection reveals new knowledge of colonial forces that affect a body and so going through that process can offer a mechanism for growth. Refusal is a passive act that, when employed in solidarity with other people, can be a very powerful way to shift dominant narratives. Cultural and economic boycotting of violent states and corporations, for example, challenges the way that dominant powers attempt to impose and with enough capacity can dismantle these powers. Collective imaginaries are where concepts for new infrastructures are designed. Anti-colonial and anti-racist knowledge production means acknowledging and respecting difference. Solidarity between different groups forms new networks that build the capacity to challenge oppressive infrastructure. Ulysses Ali Mejias describes strategies for unmapping the network. A process of generating difference and disidentification as a way to resist conforming to the logistics and logics of, di of digital infrastructure. This is a diagram I drew of a line journey that begins at gathering and passes through kinship, then solidarity and finishes at intervention. Solidarity can also include non-humans and does not necessarily need to be situated in a place and time. Donna Haraway describes kinship amongst all species as a way to resist environmental disaster. Alexis Pauline Gums uses black feminist oracle practice to access speculative worlds through historical and current artefacts. Oppressive infrastructures rely on obfuscation, inaccessibility and illegibility to be successful. Transparency, accessibility and legibility are tools to counter their harmful effects and dismantle oppressive infrastructures. The CRIP Technoscience Manifesto offers brilliant strategies for world building and dismantling. Offering people a conceptual understanding of issues is enough to provoke a response. Artistic and critical interventions that don't require an audience to have an academic background or speak a particular language, yet that can access and get across different complex concepts are valid. With all interventions, it's important to have inbuilt reflexivity. Sometimes in our efforts, we may be perpetuating behaviours that are harmful without realising. What colonialist values have we unconsciously adopted by having gone through a European education system? Designing interventions with care is essential. Design justice strategies outlined by Sasha Costanza Chok are an invaluable resource when thinking about possible interventions. Finally, for some groups and individuals suffering injustice, merely existing and thriving is enough. Radical self-care, as pioneered by the Black Panther movement, is a political act of resistance to the physical and psychological harms of oppression. Choosing self-preservation to step back and rest can mean survival. Thank you for listening.